Wherever you are on your leadership voyage, it starts here. Hey, welcome to Leadership Voyage, season two of the podcast dedicated to your pursuit of becoming a great leader. My name is Jason Wick, and I'm really excited to start season two here. We have some really wonderful guests coming over these first few months of 2023. You can check out the show's website at leadership.voyage. Or you can send me an email at startyourvoyage at gmail.com. Let me know what you think of the show. Let me know if you have ideas or comments on any of the topics that have happened thus far. Of course, of course, of course, please subscribe, tell your friends, rate and review the podcast wherever you are listening, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or elsewhere. Before we jump into the first episode of this season, which is a really great conversation with Zach Mercurio, my family and I, we came back from uh, a trip in the Midwest for Christmas time, coming back right after a storm. I wasn't feeling great. My wife had to work. It was one of those situations where it's like, you know what? Getting groceries delivered today sounds like a really good idea. So I went on Instacart, all the items I wanted, no substitutions. It was great friendly service, punctual delivery, all the things you'd hope for. You can follow the link in the show notes if you'd like to try Instacart. Let them know that we sent you and support the show. You can find grocery stores nearby you with all the products that you love from those stores, hand-selected by shoppers based on your preference. And of course, delivery in as fast as one hour. So my first conversation of 2023 is with Zach Mercurio. He is a researcher and professor uh, at Colorado State University. He's written a book called The Invisible Leader, working on another book on the topic of mattering. And in our conversation, we get to some really intense information about why people feel like they matter. You're going to learn a little bit about what the invisible leader is. What's the authentic purpose inside all of us that guides our actions? How is meaningfulness in work something that's accessible to all of us? We talk about the difference between pleasure in your work versus purposefulness in your work, and how can leaders show others that their work has an effect on human beings? Some really cool topics to dive into with Zach here. On this first episode of Leadership Voyage, Season 2, Welcome back. I'm really happy to kick off the second season of Leadership Voyage today with Zach Mercurio. It's great to meet you, Zach. Thanks, Jason. You too? Yeah, it's good to have you on. And it's kind of funny. Uh, we just kind of found out that we live maybe, I don't know, we'll guess 10 miles from each other, which is kind of interesting. But uh My wife works at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and her manager, Lauren, I think, saw you speak or something like that in the last few years. And it was just kind of a pro tip. Check, check this guy out. And and so I just reached out and it was great. Thank you for being receptive. It's it's going to be a fun conversation. I know that listeners are going to learn a lot uh, from our discussion. So thanks for setting aside some time. Of course. Of course. Yeah. And it is kind of funny that we're on video and audio with each other 10 miles away. That well, you know what? That's a good point. <laughs> uh, next season, we'll, we'll we'll figure something out. So, a few years ago, you wrote this book, "The Invisible Leader," and I checked it out last month. Really nice book. Thank you for writing it. I say that in all in all sincerity. And uh, I'll just share with everybody. It was interesting reading the title of a book uh, called "The Invisible Leader." I had an assumption in my mind before I ever opened it. And what I assumed was this was about someone, uh, or it's for someone who leads an organization or a team, and it's about how do you make yourself invisible and and make it about your team, maybe servant leadership and so on and so forth. But uh, I was very wrong, and 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 it's interesting because the invisible leader is your authentic purpose, and I'd love for you to explain to us what does it mean? What is our authentic purpose? So let me let me tell you a story about what happened during the pandemic with one of my clients. So one of my clients is a car wash, large tunnel car washing system. 
their purpose, their stated purpose is to prepare people for the future, their workers, and to provide for the community in various ways through the product they provide, which is part of people's everyday routines. And they know a lot of people who work at a car wash don't grow up wanting to work at a car wash. So they sure. realized that they had to prepare people for the future. Yeah. Think about that as the, their, their purpose. And then you think about the Colorado economy shutting down um, within two weeks of the pandemic breaking out. This company knows that this is their purpose and knows that um, they have to prepare people for the future and believes it. And the Colorado economy shuts down and the general manager of the car wash walks into his office to have this emergency meeting with all of their managers. And what he finds there is stacks of food and water and drinks. They, the, the management team had created a food bank for all of the employees that were going to lose their shifts so yeah. they could still eat, right? Yeah. And the general manager texted me a picture of it. And he said, the best part of all of this is they did it without me. What I mean by purpose, authentic purpose being the invisible leader, is that when you believe in your bigger contribution that you're here to make, which is the invisible leader, it guides your behaviors, thoughts, actions, and attitudes, reactions, better than any one person. Um, in the military, when your leader goes down, there is this phrase called leader's intent. Do what your leader would do if they were here. The invisible leader is, is the purpose. It helps you answer the question, you know, do what your purpose would have you do with the contribution you would make have you do. And that's what I mean by the invisible leader. And actually that term was not coined by me. It was coined by Mary Parker Follett in 1928. She was 1928. A man yes. Yes. And as a woman during that time, as one of the leading management thinkers, wow. Um, her philosophy is really incredible. And she said, leaders and followers are both following the invisible leader, the common purpose. So that bigger contribution we want to make is the ultimate aligner of our actions, thoughts, attitudes, and energy. Leaders who do it well embed it and enable it and allow it to guide an organization or a team more so than themselves. Love it. And thank you for the story uh, of the car wash with the pandemic hitting. It's a memorable story. And, and speaking of, of stories, one thing I will say I love for all of you listening, you're going to go out and check, check out the book, The Invisible Leader. There are a lot of memorable stories. And, and it's we all know that storytelling is a great way to to help someone identify with with what you're trying to get across, right? And you talk about um, someone in your book named Mary, which I, I believe is is a made up name, but regardless, Mary is someone who I think cleans facilities for a living on on a college campus, and she goes into retirement, and then you reveal that she voluntarily comes out of retirement because presumably she's following her authentic purpose. And what you told us in the book is Mary there on this college campus as someone who's supporting young adults in their college journey, essentially. What I'm wondering <laughs> about is, <laughs> you know, you talked about the car wash. We talk about Mary. When you look at our workforce, how mm -hmm. common do you think it is that someone is in touch with their authentic purpose and it is driving their actions? Yeah, and let me back up a little bit. So the stories that are shared, and it is a pseudonym because it was part of a research study that we mm. published, and we embedded ourselves with a group of janitors for a year and a half trying to understand what <laughs> creates meaningfulness for them and their work. And in jobs that are often overlooked by society and jobs that many people would say, gosh, well, they're just there for the paycheck. They just have yeah. to get a job. Um, what we found is that meaningfulness is accessible. In fact, the, the research on meaningfulness in work finds that there is no difference in any occupation, any socioeconomic status with the accessibility of meaningfulness in work. Mm -hmm. However, what we do know is that people who experience meaningfulness tend to have, you know, what I've come to call a so that mentality. They can link the discrete thing that they're doing with its inevitable impact, regardless of why they got the job, right? Mm -hmm. You can get a job for a paycheck. That's the meaning of the job in your life. But the meaning in the job is what you experience when you're there, why it exists. 
um, you know, what's the only reason why a janitorial position on a college campus exists? The only reason is not to clean <laughs> toilets. It's to keep facilities clean so students who live there can learn. Yeah. Mary, over her 35 years, had come to really see that, believe it, adopt that, so that mentality. And so for her, it just became natural, right, mm -hmm. over time. We don't have data on how many people experience meaningfulness, although you just gave me an idea for okay. a, a new study we need to do. <laughs> but we do have data that shows it is accessible through what's called crafting, job crafting, crafting our perspective on our work, crafting the perspective that so that mentality, and not only the individual crafting that perspective, but we know that leaders and people around other people can create environments where it's easier for people to see that so that. You know, I think I read a study recently that said up to 60% of our day is comprised of mundane routine tasks. Even if you're in your dream job, you're yeah. going to be waiting in line, scheduling meetings, rescheduling meetings, sending emails. Yeah. Um, you know, I think author Annie Dillard said, you know, how we spend our days is, of course, how we spend our lives. I think how we think about our moments is how we appraise our days. So if we think about these isolated tasks as discrete things that are just, we're doing it and we don't experience pleasure doing it. So we think it's unpleasurable. That's how our lives will be and our work will be. But if we can link the little things that we do with their inevitable human impact, that is what helps people derive a sense of meaningfulness in their work. And that's what Mary did. And that's what people who we, we study do and it is accessible in every job and every occupation because no job exists to pay somebody. Every job exists to solve a human problem or fill a human need. Yeah, and thanks for for framing it that way. You know, the job doesn't exist to clean a to uh, to uh, clean a toilet. It exists to keep a campus clean so that a student has a good learning environment. You know, I don't know. Some might think that's semantics, but I think you're making the point that when you're crafting your perspective or you have the so that mentality, it is a, a way you're looking at it. So my question from here is, there's a part of this that's within an, an individual's control, let's say, right? I, I could probably encourage myself to look at it this way. Um, if we look at it, maybe from a business perspective as well, either a manager or uh, some kind of explicit uh, or implicit leader in a, in a team or, or an organization, you know, what can they do to skew the odds that, that someone might look at, uh, they might craft a, do uh, what did you say, crafting perspective, how, how they would do that uh, to their own advantage? Yeah, I mean, leaders are architects of the environment. Uh, so it's much easier to believe in the significance of what you're doing if you experience the evidence of your significance in an environment. So leaders who tend to give people the evidence of their significance regularly tend to make it easier for people to actually see it. Hmm. And it is tempting if you're listening to think, oh, you know, this is this is idealistic, you know, to mm -hmm. think this way, you know, I mean, someone's cleaning a toilet. Come on, that's hard work. It is. But I do want to make a quick point before I get into how leaders can do this. We've become obsessed with work as pleasurable. We've become <laughs> obsessed that we deserve to derive pleasure from every part of our day. And if we're not, we should switch jobs. We should quiet quit. We should do whatever. Mm -hmm. But what we find in years of studies around what makes life worth living is that we know there is a difference between what's pleasurable and what's purposeful. Mm -hmm. And what's purposeful is not always pleasurable. It is not pleasurable staying up with my kid all night because he's sick. <laughs> it is purposeful. It is. People yeah. who tend to thrive in their work and their lives tend to focus on what's purposeful and usually pleasure follows. So I'll put that aside there. No, that's good. Thank the, you. The, the, the second piece though is that what leaders can do. I mean, if someone doesn't believe that they matter as a human being, it's almost impossible for anything to matter, right? So we need to be paying people living wages first. We need to make sure that people have access to decent work, that they don't have to worry about whether they're going to have, uh, be able to afford an emergency surgery that they need to have or their family needs to have, that they have predictable shifts, right? Mm. That they, they uh, are able to to move their schedule around to be a human, right? right? Those things are essential. That's decent work. That is the prerequisite for any of this. But the second thing is they also have to believe that they matter. I mean, they have to um, feel like what they do is worthwhile, right? I worked with a manufacturing company and they're having like a lot of turnover issues. 
and motivation and engagement issues. And one of the leaders that was responsible for their culture strategy and their talent retention strategy said, you know, Zach, at the end of the day, we're just putting parts in boxes. Ah, interesting. Well, that's about all you how, need to know, probably. Exactly. How you <laughs> how you see a job, how you see people, inevitably affects how you treat them. And um, so leaders who you know, show people that they're seen, show people evidence that their work makes a difference on other human beings, leaders that help people see how they and their unique strengths are indispensable, irreplaceable to a bigger whole, tend to create the evidence that show people the, they're significant, which makes it easier for people to authentically see that they hmm. and what they do matter. So evidence of significance of what they're doing, that's great. And and you brought up mattering and, and that people do matter. And we're going to hit that topic uh, a little bit later here too, where I can admit another thing that I, I didn't know anything about, just like the title of your book. Sticking with this idea of an organization and, and kind of teeing things up well, maybe, so that uh, people can see that their work does matter. Um, something you talk about in the book is purpose and mission. And I, I will fully admit, I think I've used mission, purpose, vision. Sometimes I've used all these words interchangeably without really thinking about it. And and you make a nice distinction in the book. Uh, let, let's hit that for a second. What's the difference between a purpose statement and a mission statement? And why does that distinction matter? So purpose is why you exist. It's the mm -hmm. problem you exist to solve. Okay. It, it it's answers the question, what would be lost if we disappeared? Mission is what you do and how you do it to deliver that purpose. And vision is what would the world be like if you were fully done? It's important to know that, you know, people use these words interchangeably. I don't care what you call them. I mean, like, sure. you know, it's the essence of what they mean that's most important. The reason why purpose is so important is because it focuses us on contribution. You know, our focus on usefulness to other people is the crux of why purpose works, to engage people. It's why purpose works to create performance, because we know that human beings are psychologically, emotionally, physically optimized when they're useful to other people, when they're focused on contribution. Something bigger so, than themselves. Yeah, so that's why purpose is so important. Another reason why purpose is so important is that a mission is what you do and how you do it. Mission, um, really the root of mission, I think the Latin root means to send out. Can you imagine being sent out to do something without a reason for doing it? <laughs> right, yeah. That's that's like what a lot of organizations have. Like we we are going to be the industry leading X, Y, and Z. Nobody cares. Yeah. Everybody in your industry says they are, want to be the industry leading thing, right? It's yeah. not a differentiator, you know, mission. So mission should describe what you do and how you do it better than anybody else to deliver your meaningful purpose. And then your vision is not like to be industry leading X, because the problem is you can achieve that. A meaningful vision is something that is so detached from the current state of the world that it constantly pulls you forward. Um, and it should be like, if you completely finished your purpose, what would the world be like? Like, think about that car wash. If everybody was prepared for the future and the community was fully provided for, what would the world be like? Yeah, ambitious um, impact yeah, on the world. Yeah. So yeah. Um, that's why those three are so important. And the essence of those three are more important than what you call them. Yeah. And I mean, it strikes me that you kind of connect these dots, right? If If I understand the purpose of the company, and I'm truly buying into that, and I can understand why my work matters, then it seems it would be a lot easier potential, you know, to, to tap into the authentic purpose. And, and the point here I'm interested in too is, how does a purpose of an individual and the purpose of an organization intersect, not intersect? When does it matter? Things like that. Yeah, I don't think it's vital to have your life purpose connect to your job's purpose. Okay. I think that's a, a partly a fool's errand because over 60% of the U S population works in service, low wage earning work. Um, mm -hmm. Many of whom probably wouldn't say that's their life's purpose and um, their life's purpose could be raising a family, providing for a fam family, you know? So yep. I think it's more important to help people be purposeful. There's a difference between like, having a purpose and being purposeful the crux of what again creates the well-being outcomes that yeah. 
purpose enables is the fact that when we have a purpose, it helps us to be purposeful. Being purposeful is contribution-centered thinking, being, and doing. And so I think it's more important not to link someone's life purpose with their job purpose, but to help people be purposeful in their jobs. And that's what's accessible everywhere. And it sort of cuts out the purpose anxiety that we see like, oh, my life's purpose doesn't perfectly match with this job. So I'm wasting my time. No, purpose is where your unique strengths make a unique impact. You use your strengths every day. You impact other people every day. Therefore, you have purpose every day. Are our expectations unreasonable to suggest, to think our life's purpose aligns beautifully with our work's purpose? And does that relate in any way to this idea that um, we expect pleasure from work? Yeah. So let's look at like what individual purpose is again. So individual purpose really arises where your unique strengths make a unique impact. Mm -hmm. You know, and for example, like I, I, I could say that my purpose is to help people to realize their own significance. Mm -hmm. Right. For example, you know, one of the, 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 the things that I like doing that energizes me and makes an impact is helping people see themselves and what they do in a different way that helps them see their significance. Right now. um, So everybody has that within them. Like you have a, an intersection of your strengths where they make the greatest impact in your life. Right. But that impact may not be accessible specifically in the job that you want or the job that you have. But what you can do is you can use your unique strengths that you have in your work to make an impact. Yeah, absolutely. So the what I think is I think there's a there's an expectation that you know your life's work should always align with a job. Hmm. But maybe it's more maybe it's more helpful to think about a job as one delivery system for delivering your strengths and your <laughs> impact. Yeah, okay. Because again, like a job a lot of people have to get jobs because they need to support other human beings. <laughs> Uh, absolutely yeah you know like that yeah. like most people like that's a worthy purpose but when we can help people in that situation to use their unique strengths and show them how their unique strengths that have helped them to provide for these people yeah. how those strengths make a unique impact in the place where they're going to spend 35 percent of their lives yeah. in their job that's where we can connect the two i think more authentically than expecting, you know, that every job fulfills our life purpose. The other thing we get into when we think that is we get into this idea in psychology called destination addiction, that if I just get this, I'll be happy. That if I just get perfect alignment, then I'll be happy. Mm -hmm. We get into this if then argument. And the problem with that is that if you get there, then what? I've met plenty of people in their dream jobs that are miserable. I've met trauma surgeons that their job is literally to save people's lives that have a meaningful job that don't experience meaningfulness in their jobs anymore. And that's, that's crazy stuff from, for those of us not in the role, it's kind of hard to imagine, but it's all in the mindset, I suppose, like you're suggesting. The good work can become routine work very quickly. Your dream job can be become, you know, routine very quickly um, without the skills to connect your work to purpose regularly and without an environment that doesn't show you the evidence of your significance. Okay, great. Let's take, yeah, let's go from here and, and go back to the, the mattering topic. So I'll, I'll admit 2022 started, I guess the, a year ago, I'm talking about a year ago. I don't know that I'd ever heard this term mattering. Like when I type mattering in the document that I prepared with you and me, it spell checks it. It says, sorry, that's not, oh, <laughs> that's not a word. Yeah. So, so here's the thing. I, I'm just like, okay, cool, cool. There's this, uh, from my point of view, not dialed into mattering, there's this slow trickle of awareness in my mind to its existence. Uh, In the spring of last year, in 2022, I saw an article from Psychology Today talking about mattering being important for mental health. I think you call out the Surgeon General acknowledging mattering is important. Um, On LinkedIn and and Medium, you are writing about this, posting about this, talking about this. To me, I think it's probably the most common topic I've seen from you over the last six months I've been aware of you. Now, You've, we we can connect the dots and, and and infer what you've said, but why don't you just tell us first and clearly 
what is mattering so that we all kind of understand what is mattering and why does it matter, which is an ironic sentence, I guess. Yeah. But. Mattering is the belief that we're a significant part of the world around us. It's the belief that we are significant to other people on this planet or in our micro world around us. Mm -hmm. Mattering is three things. It's a survival instinct that's been programmed into us for 6 million years. It is a uh, human need, fundamental motivational human need, and it is a universal longing. And what I mean by that is let's go to the first one. One, the first thing that you did as a human being was you tilted your head upward and looked for someone to value you. Um, we were searched with an encoded instinct to get a caretaker to value us so we would survive. Like all human instincts, that instinct never goes away. That is the instinct to matter to someone else. We all have that within us. Okay. It's also a fundamental human need for motivation. For example, just the fact that you got up and got out of bed today, you believed something. You believed that your life and your time was worthy of the unrelenting attention that you give it. You believe that <laughs> having this podcast interview or making breakfast, that somehow your life was significant enough yeah. to keep it going. Yeah. And then the third is that we're encoded, you know, as human beings in, in almost every culture to have this longing for meaning in life, for the meaning of life. And meaning is when things have coherence. And one of the ways that we get that meaning in life is researchers find is through other people showing us our meaning in their life, which is mattering. So life itself, biologically, psychologically, would not activate without the belief that we matter. So the degree to which we matter actually connects with the degree to which we have motivation, the degree to which we have energy to act, the degree to which we engage. And there's, and this is not a new concept. I mean, research has been around for 50 years on it. What I think the reason why you haven't heard about it is because it's so common sense. It's such a, <laughs> no, it's such a, it's such like, it's an instinct. Like we don't, we don't wake up thinking about eating. Let's talk about, well, you read a blog post on the importance of eating today. What, what I was, be like, yeah, what, what I was thinking about, you know, I, I was, uh, I was uh, at an appointment last week and I asked, I was like, you know, why does my breath really matter? You know, and then, and, and we go into the, the parasympathetic, I think that's right. I'm not a doctor, <laughs> sorry. And, and it's like, okay, actually, I kind of understand, but I don't think about it. You know, like yeah, you said, right, the, exactly. the self-awareness of mattering, you know, right. it's baked in, but yeah. we're not necessarily aware of it. Um, now, why are we thinking about it now? We're yeah, thinking why about are we thinking about it now? Because more people than ever, I think, are experiencing its absence. Uh, yeah, yeah. So when we experience the absence of something, it tends to become, quote unquote, popular, even though it was already there. Fair so, uh, and I think that, like, for example, you know, more than ever, people are indicating loneliness, yep. isolation, feelings of not, and we know this. Like, you hear these statistics. Every listener has heard the statistics. These are people around you. No one's going to run around saying, I feel lonely and I feel like I don't matter. But you course, can bet yeah. that people around you feel like that. There was a study done that found that uh, of 66,000 like students who are in sixth grade through 12th grade, when they were asked, do you think your teacher would notice if you were absent? Over half of that sample said no, strongly disagree. That's a hard one to stomach two-thirds of employees say they feel invisible at work. Um, I think the statistics are similar for leaders. There's a statistic out there that 40% of people in the world feel forgotten on a daily basis. When someone so, doesn't believe that they matter, it's really hard for anything to matter. So we shouldn't be surprised yeah, at levels of apathy, people leaving organizations, people you know, low levels of engagement, people isolating themselves, all of the other societal issues that we have, I think are a result of people fighting for the significance they don't get. So let's let, yeah, we're, this is much bigger than, than business management leadership. And let's keep it there. Let's keep it at the yeah. big level, right? You, you can walk around um, today. And um, I, I think, uh, so I was, I was reading your book and listening to it um, 
uh, on Audible when I was in Chicago for work shortly, uh, like around Hanukkah, Christmas time. And I was on the train listening to some of it. And I think there was something in there about like the effect you could have just by giving someone else a genuine smile. Mm -hmm. And so I start walking around <laughs> Chicago, 2.8 million people, whatever it is, just smile. <laughs> just smiling at people, yeah. right? Yeah. And I'm like, that's really interesting. I'm aware of it. I'm thinking about it. Let's talk about what can people do to help others feel? I, I think I focused on feeling noticed, yeah. I think was what I like to yeah. focus yeah. on here. Yeah. It seemed to me to attract me the most. Uh -huh. What can people do to help other people feel noticed? So, so Jason, yeah. Why? Did a book have to tell you to smile I, at other people? I don't know. know. I don't I know. know but I know telling. this is this is telling. what's happened, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is this is why do why do we have to read books on how that giving to other people is better than taking from them? No, you're like, right. I mean, I've got earbuds in, looking at the ground, I right? Know. And no, no, but I, I do know. it too. Yeah. I'm writing a book right now. <laughs> I'm creating <laughs> mattering, and sometimes I'm like, "What has happened to us?" But I do think that there. Again, common sense is not always common practice. And so you get into like, what's the practice? What's the deliberate practice? What I like what you did about the smiling is that you turned it from common sense into a deliberate practice. And I think we have to get back to that. These are practices that maintain our society and our workplaces. And you mentioned like, this is much bigger than work. I study work and I don't think it is bigger than work because a a, a healthy society cannot have unhealthy workplaces. People mm, okay. spend yeah. a third of their lives yeah. that they're awake for That's in their fair, jobs. Yeah. Yeah. So people try to separate work from life. It's just a job. It's not my life. It is your life. Yeah, your life exists wherever you're living and breathing, including yeah. at work. You don't just point. stop your biological functions because you clock in. Yeah. Um, and so work is important, but what can you do? One know the first and last name of your delivery driver, <laughs> call them by their name, um, ask the person in line how they're doing. Um, if your coworker was out sick, check in on them. Um, if your coworker has been struggling on a project, offer a proactive action to help. Mm. If you're in a meeting, someone goes around and they say they're overloaded, offer an action to help alleviate them being overloaded. Um, affirm people instead of just saying thank you uh tell people the difference that they make when you're leaving an airplane and you see those people come on who are cleaning the airplane don't just put your head down and get your bag and leave look at them and say hey thanks for cleaning this looks great um if you get a food service worker um instead of just treating them like a transaction treat them like a person um say hi say thank you um do this for your leaders as well um remind people of their strengths regularly the the last one show people that they're needed when's the last time you said to someone if it wasn't for you um i wouldn't be able to do what i'm doing i wouldn't right. be who i am today i wouldn't be living where i'm living we have a lot of those people in our lives who we can go through our entire existence without ever telling them that they're needed um and that's a model that i like to call noticed affirmed and needed i mean it's very easy to remember not a number right uh and those are the practices that create mattering and Great I think examples. it's the bedrock of healthy societies, healthy organizations. And without it, what happens is you get people fighting for significance. So they'll try to find other people who agree with they with what they agree with to help them feel a sense of belonging and significance that they're not getting in their general communities or workplaces. Part of the reason, part of the reason, minus <laughs> the macro political reasons, the part yeah. of the reasons why there is so much divisiveness is actually a lack of individual feelings of significance in life, which lead for the craving for significance. Yeah, there's a lot of depth there, Zach. Thank you for all that. Um, see how I just called you by your name? <laughs> Thank you, Jason. <laughs> okay, so, um, no, seriously, um, really interesting topic really important. And you just said bedrock, which probably uh, suggests that's why you're writing the book, or you, you figured that out along the way that it is the bedrock and decided to write the book. I mean, just curious, as we're kind of coming close to the end of our discussion, which has got a, a ton of great actionable things for people to, to take. Is there anything else you really want to highlight about mattering that you think we, sh we should know um, beyond what we've already said? One thing I do want to mention is that it's a practice that must be deliberately honed and 
you know, practice, like we all know that eating well is important, but it's something that you have to stick to. It's a discipline like anything else. Um, it takes work. It takes learning. Uh, it takes relearning. And so I think that all the stuff we're talking about, it can seem simple. Like it can seem like, oh, Mary just is a great person because she sees her job in this amazing way. But no, I mean, yeah. she was there for 30 years. Knowing that it's a constant practice is important, especially when you listen to podcasts like this. Got it. Yeah, thank you. Because you're right. It, there's so much of the, we, we get a little snippet and then we think, oh, that'll change everything. But the the deliberate practice of building that habit Awesome. Awesome to call that out. Thank you. So much I've learned today, Zach. You've had a great effect on, on me through the book and and uh, and through our discussion. I know I'm going to be uh, trying some new habits as a result mm -hmm. of it, um, try to build some new habits. Um, I ask all guests the same question, and I'm going to start off this second season the same way. What I ask everyone is, what is something that you've learned recently? Well, I think something that's really interesting that I've learned recently, I'm reading this, I'm reading this book by this Jewish thinker, this rabbi okay. about the difference between things in space and things in time. So like the sacredness of time and how we try to manipulate the things in space, like the things we have to do, our tasks or money or things to, to make us more comfortable. And we spend all of our time trying to manipulate things to make us feel better instead of being able to be in and embrace like the absolute irreplaceability of like the minute that we're in and soak it all in. So we're so interested in making like all the things around us optimize time, but it's really time that optimizes the things around us. Mm -hmm. And so I'm reading this philosophy, like, and it's, uh, I read a lot of philosophy stuff and it's, it's, uh, it's changed a lot for me. Interesting. Cool. Like, am I trying to manipulate stuff to make my time feel better? Or am I trying to really be in the time that I'm in? Definitely a unique a unique one. I've not heard an answer like that before. Very cool. <laughs> yeah. No, that's awesome. Thank you. Cool. Well, Zach Mercurio, for those who are really interested in this discussion today, uh, feeling inspired by it, want to learn more about mattering, about your materials, anything going on, where would we, where would you like to, to direct them? Yeah, you can. Um, so for some, for a recent article I wrote a couple months ago, you can go to zachmercurio.com and there's a blog section there if you want some more background on mattering. And then all of these practices, I, I have some blog posts from last year that articulate them a little bit better. And then feel free to jump on LinkedIn if you're on there and follow me there. That's probably the place that I'm most engaged with and active on because people actually converse about things. So yeah, yeah. Uh, feel free to jump on there and join the conversation. Awesome. So ZachMercurio.com, find Zach on LinkedIn. And I can't thank you enough for your time today. I really appreciate you spending some of that time that, that we have that's so precious, yeah. as you just called out, uh, for a really great conversation. Again, I've learned a lot. I know others will. And, and have a great rest of your day, Zach. Yeah, Thanks awesome. so much.